Welcome back to Linear Algebra. I'm Dr. Jeff Crow. Today, we're going to talk about coordinates and change of basis. As you now know, vector spaces have the notion of a basis. What you may not know is that Zorn's lemma implies every vector space has a Hummel basis, but what you do know is that every vector space that has a basis has the same number of elements in each basis. The standard ordered basis for R2 is 1, 0, 0, 1. These give you a kind of street directory for vectors in the plane. For any vector in the plane, v equals x, y, you have kind of a directory. v can be expressed as x times 1, 0 plus y times 0, 1. That tells you to go to, from the origin to the tip of the vector x, y, you go x units in the direction 1, 0. It's like saying go x blocks east and then y blocks north. A city kind of directory. We have x and y telling you how far to go in the direction of each of these vectors. But who says we have to choose the standard ordered basis for R2? If we choose something else, we get a different kind of directory. What if we choose a slightly different basis? We'll call this B2. One zero and one one. Now, you'll have a certain number of directions east and then a certain number of units kind of northeast. So if I have a vector x, y, how can I express that as a constant times 1, 0 plus another constant times 1, 1? We'll have basically 1, 0, 1, 1 times a, b equals x, y. To find the number of units to go in this slanted kind of city street lineup, we have to solve this system of equations. Clearly, we'll have b equals y, and a will be x minus y. In that way, if we have x minus y times 1, 0 plus y times 1, 1, we can reconstruct the vector x, y. So to go from 0, 0 to x, y, we need to go x minus y units to the due east and then y units northeast. When we write something as parentheses x comma y, we call this an ordered pair. If we have x comma y comma z, that's an ordered triple. If we have four coordinates, let's say a, b, c, d, this is an ordered quadruple. If we have 1, 2, through n entries in a list like this, this is an ordered n tuple. That's what it's called. Notice that for an ordered pair, 1, 2 is not the same thing as 2, 1. When you rearrange the entries 
in an ordered tuple, you get something different. An ordered basis is a tuple v1, v2, vn, where because we're writing this as an ordered tuple, the rearrangement will make a difference. If you rearrange the listing order of the elements of the basis, you get something different. Where v1, v2, through vn form a basis, for a vector space V. We can think of an ordered basis as a sequence of elements in a basis. Remember, a sequence is a function having domain either an initial segment of the natural numbers or the entire set of natural numbers. In this class, we'll only deal with finite dental vector spaces, so the domain for a uh, sequence will be always an initial segment for the natural numbers for us. As we have seen, if you have a base and you have a vector v in the larger vector space, there exist unique uh, constants c1, c2, through cn such that the vector can be expressed as a linear combination of elements in the basis. Every vector can be uniquely expressed as a linear combination of elements in a basis. Let B equals V1, V2 to Vn, B an ordered basis for a vector space V. The coordinates of any vector v in the larger vector space is the uh, vector c1 through cn, which is an element of Rn, where the constant c1 through cn, these are the unique constants such that v is expressed as c1 v1 through cn vn. So the coordinates are a column vector consisting of those scalars by which you can construct the vector v. It's like saying go two blocks to do east and then three blocks due north it's a way of constructing the vector v using the basis vectors. In defining this notion of coordinates, we need a notation for this, a notation that tells us that we're dealing with coordinates of some vector. Our notation is as follows. If v is c1, v1, through Cn, Vn for some ordered basis, V1 through Vn, then the coordinates of V relative D is C1 through Cn. Think about this. These Vs, they could come from 
any kind of vector space. It could be polynomial, all we know. We've just reduced the study of polynomials to vectors in Rn. This gives us an interesting possibility. Perhaps every finite dimensional vector space can be thought of as Rn. In other words, once we know everything about Rn, perhaps we'll know everything about finite dimensional vector spaces. Is there some grand unified mathematics out there where all we have to do is study this one theory and then we can generalize to everything? I don't know. Probably not. But it seems like an intriguing idea. Let's suppose that we have a basis that consists of the vectors 1, 1, 1, minus 1. And this is a basis for R2. Let's suppose our vector V in R2 is the vector, let's say, 3, 4. What are the coordinates of V relative to the basis V? In other words, find the constants C1 and C2 so that when we form the linear combination C1 times 1, 1 plus C2 times 1, negative 1, we end up with 3, 4. How do we do this? We can think of this as 1, 1, 1, negative 1 times C1, C2 equals 3, 4. All we have to do is solve a system of equations. Forming the augmented array, we'll take negative 1 times the top row and add it to the bottom row. Negative 1 times this plus this, negative 1 times this plus this, negative 1 times this plus this. We'll multiply the second row through by negative 1 half. And then take negative 1 times the bottom row and add to the top row. Negative 1 times this plus this. 3 is 6 halves, plus 1 half gives us 7 halves. We deduce then that the coordinates of the vector 3, 4 relative to this basis will be 7 halves, negative 1 half. Because if we take 7 halves times 1, 1 and add negative 1 half times 1, negative 1, what do we get? 7 halves minus 1 half is 6 halves, which is 3. 7 halves minus negative 1 half will be 8 halves, which is 4. On P2, the standard ordered basis is 1x, x squared. That means the coordinates of a plus bx plus cx squared relative to the standard ordered basis, which I'll call b, will be the vector a, b, c in R3. If I choose a different basis, an ordered basis, let's say 1 plus x, x plus x squared, and 1 plus x squared, how do I represent the vector 2 plus 3x plus 4x squared relative to this basis. We'll need the constants c1 times 1 plus x plus c2 times x plus x squared plus c3 times 1 plus x squared that give us 2 plus 3x plus 4x squared. Keep in mind, you equate coefficients on each side whenever you have polynomials. And so C1 plus C3 must equal 2. C1 plus C2 must equal 3. And C2 plus C3 must equal 4. We have a system of three equations and three unknowns. 
solving this system on my handheld calculator, I get C1 is 1 half, C2 is 5 halves, and C3 is 3 halves. So the coordinates are 1 half, 5 halves, 3 halves. If I'm looking at the set of all symmetric matrices, I can form an ordered basis 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 0, 1. Let's suppose that I have the matrix A equal to 2, 3, 3, 4. How do I express this matrix in terms of this basis? And in particular, what are the coordinates? We're looking for the constant C1, C2, and C3, so that when we add this linear combination up, we get the matrix A. The only place where we get this first coordinate is in the first entry, which means C1 must be 2. Similarly, C3 must be 4, and C2 must be 3. The coordinates then are 2, 3, 4. There are plenty of situations where we're working with one basis at one moment, and later on we'll want to work with a different basis. An example might be when we rotate a computer image we might be working with the standard ordered basis to begin with, but the rotated image requires that we work with a rotated basis through some angle theta. How do we relate the coordinates of a vector expressed in coordinates with respect to one basis and then change with respect to another basis? In other words, let's suppose that we have B1 and B2. Is there a relationship between the coordinates of a vector relative to B1? How is it related to the coordinates of the same vector with respect to V2? What is the relationship between these two coordinate representations? To understand this better, let's have a little lemma. Let's suppose that we're dealing with the coordinates of a v1 plus b v2 relative to a basis. I claim that that's equal to a times the coordinates of v1 plus b times the coordinates of v2 relative to the basis b. In our proof, according to the definition, the coordinates of some vector v relative to a basis are the scalar c1 through cn such that v is c1 v1 through cn vn relative to the basis b consisting of the vectors v1 through vn. But it follows that a v is a c1 v1 through a CNVN, which implies that the coordinates of AV relative to the vector B are AC1 through ACN. It follows then that the coordinates of AV relative to a basis B are A times the coordinates of V relative to B. Similarly, The coordinates of V plus W relative to B are the coordinates of V relative to B plus the coordinates of W relative to B. We deduce then that the theorem is true. If I have the coordinates of AV plus BW, that'll be A times the coordinates of V relative to the basis plus B times the coordinates of W relative to the basis, and that completes the proof.
Now, suppose that suppose that v is a v1 plus b v2. Let's suppose our basis basis one consists of v1 v2. We'll limit ourselves to two dimensions here just for sake of argument. That means that the coordinates of V relative to B1 are A, B. Let's suppose also V is C, V1 hat plus D, V2 hat, where B2 is V1 hat, V2 hat. We have a different basis. V relative to B2 is C, D. So even though V has this coordinate representation, it has this expression as well. So V relative to B2 will be the coordinate representation of AV1 plus BV2 relative to B2. We'll apply our lemma next. We'll have then A times the coordinates of V1 relative to B2. Two, the hatted basis, plus b times the coordinates of v2 in the unhatted basis expressed relative to the hatted basis. Now, this is like taking the matrix where the first column is v1 in the unhatted basis expressed relative to the hatted basis times v2 b2 times the vector a b but keep in mind what a b is the vector a b is the coordinates of v relative to b1 so we'll have the coordinates of v1 b2 the coordinates of v2 b2 times the coordinates of v relative to b1 let me put this in a different way. We deduce then the following theorem. That let B1 be an ordered base V1 through Vn. B2 is an ordered basis V1 hat to Vn hat. then the coordinates of any vector v relative to basis b2 is the following matrix. The first column is v1 relative to b2. The last column is vn relative to b2. And then the coordinates of v relative to b1. This matrix is called the transition matrix. It allows you to go from one basis representation to a different basis representation. The transition matrix has its own notation. It's I B one B two is V one B two through V N B two. So you take the elements from the first basis and you find their coordinates with respect to the second basis. Put those down columns and form a matrix. And that gives you the transition matrix. That transition matrix allows you to go from one of coordinates to a different set of coordinates by matrix multiplication. When studying a new concept, it's always important to look at simple examples in great detail to fully understand the theory. Let's suppose that we have the basis B1, which is the standard ordered base for R2. One unit this way, one unit this way. And let's suppose that B2 is a rotated basis 
through an angle of, let's say, 45 degrees. Let's have the vector 1, 1. Not a unit vector, but still pointing out 1 unit over, 1 unit up, 45 degrees out into the first quadrant. And another vector, let's say, negative 1, 1. So we are rotating the basis and dilating it a little bit through an angle of 45 degrees. Let's suppose that we have a vector v, which is 3, 4. The coordinates of v, the coordinates of v relative to the standard ordered basis are clearly 3 and 4. 3 times 1, 0, plus 4 times 0, 1. What are the coordinates relative to b2? A quick calculation shows that they are 7 halves and 1 half. If I take 7 halves times 1, 1 and add 1 half times negative 1, 1, what do I get? 7 halves minus 1 half is 6 halves, otherwise known as 3. 7 halves plus 1 half is 8 halves, otherwise known as 4. Now, according to our theory, the coordinates of V relative to B2 are supposed to be the transition matrix B1 to B2 of the coordinates of V relative to B1. Let's calculate the transition matrix and then verify that this is true. We'll preserve over here the coordinates of V relative to B1 are 3, 4, and the coordinates of V relative to B2 are 7 halves, 1 half. In the transition matrix, we have to take an element from the first basis and express it relative to the second basis. Let's see if we can figure this out easily enough. If we subtract these two, we'll get 0 in the second coordinate, and we'll get 2 in the first coordinate. So what do you say we have? So what do you say that 1, 0 is 1 half 1, 1 minus 1 half negative 1, 1? Is that true? 1 half minus negative 1 half is 1. 1 half minus 1 half is 0. That means the coordinates are 1 half negative 1 half. To get the coordinates of 0, 1, relative to B2. Well, it looks like we add them this time. 1 half, 1 half. That'll do it. That means then that the transition matrix, which has this notation, from B1 to B2 is the matrix 1 half, negative 1 half, 1 half, 1 half. Let's check this. Our theory tells us the coordinates of V relative to B2 have to be the transition matrix B1 to B2 times the coordinates of V relative to B1. Let's check and see if that's true. The transition matrix is 1 half, 1 half, minus 1 half, 1 half. The coordinates relative to B1 are 3 and 4. When we perform the matrix multiplication, we'll get 3 halves plus 4 halves, which is 7 halves. Negative 3 halves plus 4 halves is 1 half. And that is indeed the set of coordinates of V relative to B2. So we've seen in detail that this formula holds in this particular case. Don't be afraid to get down into the nitty gritty of arithmetical computations in checking out these simple theories. It's important to do this. Why are we using this identity matrix I? Try this. Suppose B is an ordered basis, V1 through Vn. What is the transition matrix from B to B? Well, it's the coordinate of all these relative to this basis itself.
But what is the what are the coordinates of VK relative to this basis? Well, VK is 1 times VK. That means its coordinates are zeros except for a 1 in the kth spot and then a bunch of zeros. So the kth coordinate is 1. Everything else, else is 0. That gives us EK. It follows then that you're going to get 1 zeros, 0 1 zeros, and so on you'll get the identity matrix. Whenever you express some set of coordinates relative to itself, the transition matrix is the identity matrix. Do you remember how to rotate axes from pre-calculus? Remember when you rotated the coordinates for those conic sections in order to middle eliminate the xy term and then graph those conic sections on rotated axes? That was some kind of an amazing mathematics back then, wasn't it? But the coordinate functions were as follows. The, you had x prime coordinates. And x and y coordinates. And they're rotated through some angle theta. They're related to each other by the following formulas. x prime cosine theta minus y prime sine theta, y was x prime sine theta plus y prime cosine theta. We can see then that we can see then that we have the transition matrix cosine theta minus sine theta sine theta cosine theta times the primed coordinates gives us the unprimed coordinates. What if you wanted this the other way around? Seems like you'd have to multiply by the inverse of this transition matrix, in which case you would have x prime, y prime. And what is, notice the determinant is 1, cosine squared plus sine squared. And then you switch the diagonals, same thing, negate the off diagonals. That's going to be cosine theta, sine theta, negative sine theta, cosine theta x, y. This raises an interesting issue about the relationship between a transition matrix and its inverse. Notice that V relative to B2 is the transition matrix from B1 to B2 times the coordinates of V relative to B1. If you take the inverse of this matrix, you'll get V relative to B1 is the inverse B1, B2 times the coordinates of V relative to B2, multiplying by the inverse on both sides of this equation. We obtain this. But this was supposed to be the coordinates of V relative to B1 are the transition matrix from B2 to B1 of the coordinates of V relative to B2. We deduce then the following theorem. The transition matrix B2, B1 is the inverse of the transition matrix B1, B2. Matrices of the form have a lot of interest in their own right, it's possible to show that under matrix multiplication, these sorts of matrices form what is called a group. We've talked about a group. They are closed under matrix multiplication, matrices of this form. They also have an inverse and an identity, the identity being the identity matrix. To see the closure under matrix multiplication, suppose I have another matrix B, which is cosine phi, sine phi, minus sine phi, cosine phi. 
If we multiply a times b, what do we get? We'll have cosine theta, cosine phi, and then minus sine theta, sine phi. Does that look like an identity? This times that. Then we get this times this. That's going to be cosine theta sine phi plus sine theta cosine phi. And then we get minus sine theta, um, how did that go? Cosine phi followed by minus cosine theta sine phi, and then finally cosine theta cosine phi minus sine theta sine phi. Now, if you remember your sum and difference of angle identities, you'll recognize this as a sum of angle identity for cosine. You get the same thing in the lower right. On the upper right, you get a sum of angle identity for sine. In the lower left, we have a negative we can factor out to get the negative of the sine of theta plus phi. So any matrix of this form times another matrix of the same form gives you a matrix having exactly the same form. It is closed under matrix multiplication. Every matrix of this form has an inverse. We've seen how to calculate these inverses. In addition, there's an identity. And we know that matrix multiplication is associative. So we have the associative law. Those are all of the elements to make a group the collection of matrices of this form is called the special orthogonal group. It's sometimes denoted by SO2. We're in two dimensions after all. So rotating vectors in space, that would require SO3. This is the special orthogonal group. It rotates vectors in the plane through rigid angles, and it doesn't change a 90 degree angle. What starts out as a 90 degree angle between two vectors in pre-rotated vectors will still have a 90 degree angle between them, and so it preserves that orthogonality. The special orthogonal group is important in a lot of applications. In particular, gravitation is invariant under applications of the special orthogonal group, for instance, and slightly more general groups as well, in particular, the so-called Galileo group. There are a lot of other interesting matrix groups that are important. I just thought that you know at least this one right now. It turns out a lot of physics is based upon symmetries. And the orthogonal group, if something is invariant, a physical law, for instance, doesn't change under applications of these sorts of changes of coordinates. We say that the space has that kind of symmetry. If uh, gravity looks the same no matter which way you're looking, it has that kind of symmetry. The difference between the special orthogonal group and the orthogonal group, O of 2, is that the orthogonal group allows for reflections as well, reflections through certain lines passing through the origin, whereas the special orthogonal group only allows for rigid rotations. There are a lot of applications to this theory involving coordinates. In particular, let's think about differential equations. In particular, I want to look at 
second order linear homogeneous ordinary differential equations. Don't be alarmed. The more adjectives you tack on, the easier the theory. These sorts of differential equations have the following form. They'll have some arbitrary function of x times y double prime, an arbitrary function of x times y prime, an arbitrary function of x times y equals 0. They're linear whenever you have function times second derivative to the power of 1 in the numerator, y prime in the numerator to the power of 1 in a different term, and y to the power of 1 in the numerator in a separate term, an arbitrary function of x times each of these. Equals 0, it means yeah, <clears throat> when you have this expression equal to 0, that's when it is homogeneous. It's second order because the highest order derivative that appears is the second order derivative. It turns out that the solution space for these second order linear homogeneous ordinary differential equations is a vector space. It's closed under addition, closed under scalar multiplication. Let's at least see some of that theory. Note. If y1, y2 solve that equation, then c1, y1 plus c2, y2 solves it for any constants c1 and c2. To see this, we'll just plug this into the differential equation and see if we get a solution if y1 and y2 are. We'll have a2, I'll suppress the functional dependence on x, but this is a function of x, times c1 y1 plus c2 y2 double prime plus a1 times c1 y1 plus c2 y2 prime plus a0 times c1 y1 plus c2 y2. The linear combination will be a solution provided we get 0. It, then it will satisfy the differential equation. But to see this, all we have to do is note that we can rearrange this a little bit. We get c1 times a2 y1 double prime plus a1 y1 prime plus a0 y1 plus c2 a2 y2 double prime plus a1 y2 prime plus a y2. Now, y1 and y2 are solutions to the differential equation, which means you get 0 for both of these, and that means we get 0 for the whole thing. Therefore, c1 y1 plus c2 y2 is a solution. That means that the solution space is a subspace of the vector space of two times differentiable functions. So the solution set to this second order linear homogeneous ordinary differential equation is a subspace of C2, the vector space of two times continuously differentiable functions. Let's do another example. Let's suppose that we're dealing with a y double prime plus b y prime plus c y equals zero. And let's suppose that we have a solution of the form y equals e to the lambda x, where, where lambda is some constant, possibly, in the set of complex numbers for all we know then 
y prime will be lambda e to the lambda x, and y double prime will be lambda squared e to the lambda x. If we plug these into the differential equation, we get a lambda squared e to the lambda x, and the lowercase lambda is this, the uppercase is like this. It's spelled L-A-M-B-D-A. -A. We'll have B lambda e to the lambda x plus C e to the lambda x equals zero. Now we can divide e to the lambda x out of the entire expression and we'll have zero equals A lambda squared plus B lambda plus C, all equal to zero. And so the solution will be found by the quadratic formula. It could be complex if the discriminant under the radical is negative. Lambda equals minus b plus or minus a root b squared or minus 4ac all over 2a. I know the quadratic formula song. Have you ever heard the quadratic formula song? It's to that catchy tune, Pop Goes the Weasel. Oh yeah. I know, it's hard to get that out of your head. How do you unhear that? Nonetheless, the quadratic formula song, there it is. It'll be complex solutions if you get a negative under the radical, if the discriminant is negative. You might get lambda 1 and lambda 2, in which case we'll have two functions that will solve our original equation. y1 equals e to the lambda 1x and y2 equals e to the lambda 2x. We know that arbitrary linear combinations of solutions will be solutions. So we'll have y equals c1 e to the lambda 1x plus c2 e to the lambda 2x will be a solution for arbitrary c1 and c2. In our course on differential equations, we prove that e to the lambda 1x and e to the lambda 2x form a basis or the solution space to this homogeneous linear equation, in which case arbitrary linear combinations will span the entire solution space, which means that every solution to our second order linear constant coefficient homogeneous ordinary differential equation will be in this expression for different values of C1 and C2. We'll have covered them all. The span of the basis, remember it spans the entire space, so the solution set will be expressible in general in this form. We kind of expect with a second order equation like that to get two arbitrary constants of integration since we have to undo two derivatives. Those constants appear here as C1 and C2. If the equation is non-homogeneous, We'll have some forcing function f of x over here. How do you solve these? The answer is very much like solving ax equals b versus ax equals 0. To solve ax equals 0, you find a basis for the solution space to the homogeneous equation. And then arbitrary linear combinations will also be solutions. Not quite the same down here. For this case, you find a basis, and then the homogeneous solution will be an arbitrary linear combination. And here, though, every homogeneous solution gives you 0, not b. So you find what is called a particular solution, and then the general solution will be the particular solution plus the homogeneous solutions. A times xp will be b. A times xh will be 0. And so we'll have a particular solution plus the span of the basis elements for the solution space to the corresponding homogeneous equation. And that gives you the solution space, the solution set to these non-homogeneous equations. It works the same here. To get the general solution, you find a particular solution to the non-homogeneous problem. 
plus C1, Y1 plus C2, Y2, where Y1 and Y2 form a basis for the solution set to the corresponding homogeneous equation where you have zero on the right-hand side. We developed this theory in full in our course on differential equations. When I taught differential equations at the University of California at Davis, a course in linear algebra was required as a prerequisite. That's because so much of the theory of linear algebra is used directly in a course on differential equations. The same is true in a course in partial differential equations, as you'll find out as you go up the line. 